So quality standards for prevention and control of infections okay, for ICM to implement infection control strategies in a hospital, what quality standards at a physical structure level you should follow? Okay, First is the responsibility. The first responsibility of implementing ICM and quality standards comes from the leadership. Leadership, whoever is the leader in the hospital, it could be the chairman, administrator, owner, trustees, Okay, based on what type of what kind of type of governance you have in the hospital, whoever has the topmost decision making power, okay, it's their responsibility to make sure that the foundation, physical foundation, should be laid for people of, to practice infection control guidelines. Okay, then resources. After laying down the physical structure, you should give them the resources. Like make sure enough personal protective equipments are there, enough hand hygiene solutions are there, sterilites are available, okay, um, medications are available, uh, take, uh, books and manuals on antibiotic stewardship, other infection control practice guidelines on, on a, uh, in a manual base should be made available to all the practicing departments okay so that comes under the resources budgeting has to be done annual budgeting just for infection control prevention practices budgeting should be a part of it okay then goals of infection control pro program it has certain pillars like controlling the healthcare associated infection antibiotic stewardship surveillance patient safety okay these all are the using personal protective equipments, hand hygiene. These all are the main goals of infection control program. So establishing guidelines so that people practice this, clinicians and healthcare workers practice this, okay? Then medical equipment, devices and supplies should be of, should be in enough number. Medical equipment and the devices, supplies should be safe for patient to use. Okay, good quality, health, health grade quality uh, devices and supplies should be made available. Enough number of it. So you should not, the inventory should not run out of uh, these supplies. Okay, then biomedical waste management and prevention. Okay, healthcare waste management and prevention should be done. Uh, construction risk, if there is any renovation going on, okay, any construction and any renovation going on in the physical structure, you have to do the risk analysis, okay. If the construction carries on, who all, which all department, which all employees, which all patient sector will be at the risk of infection, uh, infection uh, like it will be contagious, okay. Construction, renovation, uh, these kind of situations are always contagious, okay, because there is a lot of dust in the atmosphere, certain pipelines, a major pipelines of a gas supply pipelines of the wards may get disrupted, okay, so there are a lot of safety risks associated with construction and renovation, so that has to be assessed. Next you have is the transmission of infection to prevent the transmission of infection. Okay, certain steps have to be taken. And those will involve uh, wearing personal protective equipments for practicing hand hygiene. Okay, isolation of uh, airborne diseases. Okay, finding out the cause of outbreak managing the uh, following outbreak management. Okay, they all come under controlling the transmission of infections. 
then having quality improvement programs and quality improvement education should be imparted to your employees on a regular basis. Okay, at least once in four months, once in six months, certain quality control seminars has to be taken, workshop has to be taken, induction training has to be done so that the staff stay aware of what challenges they may face and how to overcome these challenges. And medical equipment, devices, and supplies. How can you take care of the medical equipments and devices in such a way that uh, it will not cause any harm? It will make sure that it will not transmit any infection. Okay. So, depends on the um, processing of the equipment. Okay. Based on plotting classification, you can decide what kind of processing a medical equipment or a supply will require okay sprouting classification we will discuss in detail in one of the infection control classes okay sprouting classification is basically done to identify which kind of process uh, device processing has to be followed uh, on different equipments based on how it touches the patient body if it is touching the uh, upper surface area of the patient's body low level disinfection is enough okay like stethoscope Pigmo manometer, thermometer, okay. These are only touching the upper level of uh, patient's body. So you don't require high level disinfection or sterilization in these equipments. Uh, uh, certain fiber optic equipments that will go inside the patient's body, it will touch the mucous membrane of the patient's body, but these are fiber optic in nature. They cannot withstand heat, okay. They cannot withstand high levels of heat. In such cases, high level disinfection has to be done. Okay, because it does not require heat. And sterilization, sterilization is usually done for any invasive equipment that touches the patient's body, okay, uh, touches the blood body fluid of the patient's body. Okay, in such cases, high level disinfection will be done. Then storage after cleaning and sterilization, how do you store these articles? After processing has been done, how will you store it? There is a technique of storing it items. Okay, You can't just drop it anywhere after processing. It has to be a closed cabinet. It should be a moisture-free cabinet. Okay, There should not be access of pathogen or other any, any individual's direct access to these cabinets. Okay, That has to be prevented. Okay. Uh, so th those those guidelines will come under storage after cleaning and sterilization. Then demolition, construction, renovation. Okay, any part of the hospital which is undergoing demolition, construction, renovation, what uh, situations you have to analyze, what areas you have to take care of, okay, in different scenarios. So, when you organize, when the organization conducts a, a pre-construction risk assessment, okay, a risk assessment is do always done before breaking down any physical structure. Only after conducting the risk assessment, discussing it with the hospital infection control committee, the risk that you have assessed. Okay, uh, only after doing the risk assessment, you will know what are the risky areas. Okay, where where you have to be careful. Where what are the how things can go wrong? To what extent things can go wrong? Okay, after having a data collection on all all these points, have a discussion with the hospital infection control committee and then you will come to the terms of how construction renovation or demolition has to be done so first is the air quality when you demolish something or construct something there will be cement dust will that will be spread in the atmosphere okay so air quality will definitely go down but to what extent 
how it will how the air quality will affect the patients okay how the air quality will affect the uh, health of the patients who are admitted okay these things has to be assessed so that is air quality then you have uh, infection control so even with dust okay even if it is just dust infection control has to be done because uh, even at ward level dry mopping is not done just because you don't know do not want dust to be dispersed into the atmosphere because there are high chances that this dust may carry something that is infectious and patients can breathe it and they may get more sick okay so infection control is uh, wherever there is a dust there is a risk of dust being propagated infection control plays a key role there okay then utilities which all utilities will be affected okay for example the construction is going on in the third floor the third floor around the washroom toilet areas utilities will be affected so the patients who are in those wards do you have a backup utility okay which utility area they will use Okay, how you will solve the issues of the utilities. Okay, so that has to be sorted. Then you have noise control. Whenever construction, demolition, renovation takes place, a lot of equipments are used which are very noisy. Okay, construction, de de uh, demolition, okay, these are like, these create noise pollution in the surrounding areas. So healthcare organization or hospital is a department where you cannot afford to have a noisy environment okay you you need the environment to be very calm composed so that it helps in the patients to heal okay to recover okay, you can't have a noisy environment you can't do construction at night when the when the patients are resting okay that will create more damage to the patient so how what how do you plan to con uh, to have a control over noise okay what timings you will set for deconstruction or demolition which will not affect the uh, hospital's work okay it will not negatively impact the hospital's work but it will also lead to the successful completion of constructions then you have vibration Wherever there is a construction, certain equipments that we that you use, it will vibrate the walls. It will vibrate the wall uh, floors as well. Okay, and uh, vibration will also not give uh, the when the surrounding environment is vibrating out of tremendous noise that is produced. Okay, that will also make sure that you are not uh, your patients are not recovering properly. Okay, so you should have a hold on that as well certain devices you will not be using in hospital certain demolition device devices you will not be using in hospital to prevent this issue of vibration next you have hazardous material so hazardous material it's like any any architectural supply or material that you use in your construction procedure that may be chemically very hazardous for the environment or if it gets spilled or if it leaks okay it will cause more harm to the hospital uh, employees or wards or patients okay so have a control over have a say over what can be used in the hospital's construction on demolition, what cannot be used. Then you have emergency services. So emergency services as well. In case of leakage, of oxygen or certain certain gas pipelines in the hospital has bursted during construction how how well equipped are you to make sure that in emergency you can vacate 
the patients you can vacate your employees to a safer site okay so those all come under the emergency services other hazards that affect healthcare okay and treatment and services uh, which are which you cannot uh, assess in the risk assessment okay it can pop up from anywhere okay which you may not be prepared for Then control infection transmission by air. So you will have a barrier precaution. What are the examples of barrier precaution? Using gloves, mask, face shield, goggles. Okay, these are barriers, personal protective, protective barriers that will protect the staff as well as the patients from the spread of infection. Then you have the airborne infection isolation room or negative pressure rooms. Okay, whenever there is an outbreak of any airborne infection, okay, like COVID-19 and all, uh, certain wards will be converted into airborne infection isolation room. All the patients who are suffering from the same kind of infection will be admitted in these rooms. Then temporary negative pressure isolation room. Again, uh, in COVID cases also, you can put COVID patients here or any, any swine flu patients, SARS patients, acute respiratory infection patients can be put in um, negative pressure isolation room, TB patients also, okay, to protect other patients from the transmission of infection. Okay, these are negative pressure isolation rooms. It creates a negative pressure, which means you have to use an exhaust system in the negative pressure isolation room in such a way that the air, infected air, is pulled out of the room. Okay, it is filtered using UV radiation and then it is put out into the environment. That is the concept of negative pressure isolation. <laughs> then using HEPA filters. Full form of HEPA is high efficiency particulate air filtration systems. So in all the operation theaters and also in positive pressure isolation rooms, HEPA filters can be used. In operation theaters, OT complexes, HEPA filters can be used. Okay, It is done to protect the patient who has been admitted. He, could, he or she could be immunocompressant. Okay, you want to protect the patient from the infectious hospital atmosphere. That's why HEPA filters can be used. Okay, it can filter out microbes which are as low as, which are as low as 5 microns in diameter. Which are 5 microns in diameter. So that's about the physical structures in uh, quality. If you have any queries, you can mention the chat box. It's a it's a like vast area. You just have to read out. Much questions will not come from this chapter. You just have to read these few chapters. Okay.